another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin, and I have with me Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and one of the devs of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks hey, again. Hey, Brock. You may notice our voice call is a little different this time, Jeff, because we're doing this on a phone instead of on Skype this time. And yeah, this, it, is, a, this it, is a great experiment here. Uh, we're testing various different recording services for Reasons that are completely uninteresting, and uh, Brock has the fantabulous fortune to be on a cell phone, so he sounds a little bit like he's on the other end of a tin can and string. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, as usual, uh, we have our website, rce-cast.com. On there, you can find uh, our Twitter links, uh, and you can you post who's going to be on there, and you can send us questions for things you'd like to hear about. There's also a nomination form, so if there's anything you'd like to hear on the show, please include that. Uh, Jeff, you also have a blog we link to off of that page. I do, and it's almost like we have to mention this every show, isn't it? <laughs> I, I have a blog on there. Um, I, I write random musings about MPI and various HPC topics and things like that. And we also get, uh, you know, via the social networking questions and comments for upcoming things, of which we've got a couple of questions this time for... Uh, our show today, and our show today is Brock. Uh, it is Lamps, a MD code from Sandia, and so we have one of the guys who works on that. And actually, I've been lurking on the Lamps list for quite a while for stuff related to my job, and this guy, his ability to answer questions quickly and concisely is amazing. I don't know how he even manages to work on the code ever, but we have Steve Plimpton from, um, he's actually at Sandia, so... Um, Steve, welcome to the show, and please tell us a little bit about yourself. Great. Thanks. Happy to be here. Uh, yeah, I've been at Sandia about uh, 20 years, I guess. Hard to believe. It's gone by fast. Uh, Sandia is a Department of Energy laboratory in New Mexico, and I came uh, from a computational modeling group, a physics uh, background here doing uh, simulations of solids and got involved in a parallel computing group. Uh, that was about the time 20 years ago parallel computing was just starting to take off for scientific simulations. And so over the years, I've uh, just been involved in a variety of uh, different algorithm and code development projects, uh, most of them around different kinds of particle simulations. And the one that's, I guess, consumed most of my time and energy has been this LAMPS project you mentioned. And so that's an open source code that we've uh, distributed for the last five years or so that's... Uh, uh, found some use and utility for different people and groups, and so we, we kind of support it and interact with those people in a collaborative sense. So, uh, so we're here to talk specifically uh, about LAMPS, but we actually had a question from a, a pretty heavy user of LAMPS. Carolyn asked, uh, how did you get started in high-performance computing? You, you said that uh, you kind of ended up at Sandia. Um, how did you end up explicitly on LAMPS? Um, yeah, so the group here at Sandia initially was just looking to explore parallel computing as a way to do a new kind of high-performance computing for a variety of science simulations, and the background I had in doing some molecular dynamics in graduate school was kind of my entry into to looking at parallel algorithms for doing MD. Um, that kind of led initially to some collaborative work with some companies in the mid-90s that were supportive of that effort. That's where the initial version of LAMPS uh, was created in Fortran. Uh, I guess that's been 15 years ago. And so over time, we did that kind of initially was a proprietary project with those companies to develop the initial version, and then we moved it to open source and rewrote it in C++ about five or six years ago and have kind of just gone on from there. Okay. So LAMPS, it's an MD code, but MD can mean a lot of things. Um, you know, what, can you describe exactly what LAMPS focuses in? Sure. So more specifically, it's a classical MD code, which would differentiate it from, say, quantum-based codes or, or other, other kinds of molecular dynamics. Um, uh, classical means that it just uses simple empirical formulas, so it's kind of a coarser model, say, than a quantum code. Uh, LAMPS, more generally, you can think of it as just kind of a Newton solver or a time integrator for a collection of particles, and so the particles can be at an atomic scale. They can be actual atoms or more coarse-grained, you know, pieces of molecules or molecules themselves. So that's kind of the traditional classical MD 
code, uh, but more generally they could be mesoscopic particles or even ma macroscopic particles, little granular uh, particles or even pieces of a continuum model. So you can, there are uh, interaction potentials and boundary conditions and options in LAMPS to sort of simulate particles at a lot of different lengths and time scales. Uh, one thing, for those who, who didn't catch it, we've been saying MD quite a bit here. MD refers to molecular dynamics, right, Steve? Yes. Okay, good. Just, just to make sure we're all on the same level field here. Um, but you, you mentioned a, a couple years ago you rewrote LAMPS in, in C++. What, uh, what prompted that? Why did you guys do that? Um, well, the Fortran, initial Fortran version we'd probably had eight to ten years of effort into, and what we found is that as you, you – use your, your molecular dynamics code, your MD code on a new project. You typically have a new model. Maybe you need new properties with your atoms, new boundary conditions, new force fields. Uh, and as, as we kind of rework that loop many times, the, code, the old code got kind of crufty and difficult to work with, and we realized we needed a more general sort of code framework that allowed you flexibility to add things easily. And so uh, that was kind of the motivation for rewriting the code, and we thought, C++ had matured enough on high-end parallel computing platforms that the compilers were good. Uh, the performance, if you wrote more C-like, C++ was basically equivalent to Fortran, and so we thought it was a good time to try to make a more flexible general code. The flexibility of the input format for LAMPS is one reason a group that I know that uses it um, chose to use LAMPS was one of the many reasons. What's been the speed of adding new methods and new features that they've been appearing in LAMPS. Okay, yeah, so f f when I was talking about flexibility, I wasn't focusing so much on the input options, uh, but more on, more on I think, the latter part of your question, the ability to add new methods or new features to the code with relatively low overhead and do it in a way that sort of doesn't conflict with the features that are already there. And so that was one of the design uh, goals we had with the new C++ version, and in, and in hindsight, um, I, don't, I don't think we had any great vision necessarily, but in hindsight, you know, giving that flexibility and allowing things to be added fairly easily was probably the best feature we put in the, in the new version of the code, because that has enabled a lot of, not just ourselves, but other people who've wanted to either contribute code that ends up making it into the main release or just modify it for their own purposes and use it internally. I know a lot of people do that. It has made it relatively a relatively low barrier for people to do that, and so I think that is one thing that people like about the code. So, how much of a community have you built up around LAMP? So, you know, user random user contributions are are kind of important. Are you, you know, how do, how does it work? Are you the core developers there at Sandia, and you get random other stuff, or have you uh, evolved and gotten some other core developers outside of Sandia, or you know, how does your community generally work? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's it's pretty informal and grassroots. Uh, certainly the core group of developers that have been with the code from the beginning are here at Sandia, a small group of us. Uh, there are several active people who we've kind of just met through, you know, mail lists and other email interactions that have contributed significant pieces to the code. Um, the The community around LAMPS, I think, has mainly just been built through the mail list and through you know, people sending things in to us that we add. I'm sort of the gatekeeper. I wouldn't call it a truly open source project in the sense that, you know, there's just a, a zillion people who check into the main repository and the code kind of grows uh, randomly. I'm sort of the gatekeeper for that process in terms of checking things into the main version to kind of keep some consistency and make sure there aren't new bugs that get generated accidentally. But uh, there has been a lot of stuff that has just come out of the blue that we've you know, massaged a bit and added to the main code. And like I said, I think other people just kind of do that on their own and are able to keep up with the main branch with their own uh, private things they've modified and added. So extending into the community outside, just specifically LAMPS, there's a lot of MD codes out there. You know, we've had Gromax on the show and Humdi uh, by Josh Anderson, which actually draws a lot of its influence from LAMPS. What really distinguishes LAMPS from these other codes and what is your relationship with other MD projects out there? Hmm, that's a good question. So, uh, yeah, there certainly are a lot of MD codes. M MD in general, I think, has been popular for 
high performance computing because these kind of particle simulations are sort of well designed and scalable for high end uh, parallel computers. Um, so I, I think uh, a lot of the big op sort of open source, openly available MD codes that are out there, uh, many of them have sort of a bio emphasis. Uh, they've been used for proteins and DNA, big uh, bio kinds of simulations. So Gromax that you mentioned, uh, NAMD, some of the older codes that have a long legacy and a really wide user community like Charm and Amber are in that category. So one thing, LAMPS maybe is a little different from those. I would say for bio problems, those codes certainly have a lot more features and, and often are kind of tuned and optimized for those kind of problems and do quite well. It's hard to compete with some of the feature sets those codes have. LAMPS tries to maybe be a little more general in terms of not being just biospecific but being uh, having a lot of force fields and interatomic potentials for material systems and some of these other coarse-grained and mesoscopic and continuum systems I mentioned. Uh, you mentioned HUMD, that's a, a, a code, uh, as you said, that Josh Anderson has been working on for a few years. I think it's a, a interesting code that's different from all those others I just listed in that it's kind of designed from the ground up for GPUs. And so he's made a lot of uh, nice contributions and, and shown a lot of impressive results for getting really fast uh, speed ups on that specific hardware. And so I think he's trying now to broaden the, the class of problems that HUMD, his code, can uh, work on. And so it's kind of a, a new interesting entry to this field of open source MD codes. So do you actively collaborate with any of these other projects or, or do you, you know, keep tabs on, on, you know, what techniques and things that they're using and is there any kind of cross-pollinization between projects? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say any of that, you know, I wouldn't say interaction or collaboration happens in a formal sense, but it certainly does informally. I mean, you know, we, we read papers and I'm sure that happens vice versa that the different groups write about the different things they're adding. Um, we may you know, hear of a method, you know, somebody on our mail group may say, we, you know, we were able to do this in another code, this would be a nice feature to add to LAMPS. And so if it's something that's relatively easy for us to do, we might, we might pick up a feature that way. Um, I know there's a couple people, somebody who's really active in our uh, user community and mail list is a, a, a person from Temple University, Axel Kohlmeyer. And I think he's also active, for example, in the Humdi community. So there's some cross-pollination uh, that happens that way. Yeah, no, I've uh, met Axel, and he's a really bright guy. And yeah, yeah. I can't believe he is. He works, and he works on not just MD codes. He works on uh, other other kinds of open source materials modeling codes as well. So he's a really uh, a yeah, great no, he's contributor. Yeah, BMD and everything else too, man. He's all over yep, the place. Yep, BMD also. That's right. And he's still going to help people too. He's a really nice guy. So uh, actually, curious about some of the, moving into some of the performance stuff. It seems like every now and then it comes up on the lamps list, running only. So if you got a four-core processor, actually only running two cores because of memory bandwidth issues and stuff. What's some of the focuses you look at when trying to get good single-core performance out of uh, out of an MD application? So the the fundamental issue I think with MD. Is, is you have this collection of particles that's moving around and you need to, typically the interactions that you want to compute are for particles that are geometrically close to each other. And so you need some efficient way to find what particles are close to each other. Often that's in, in the MD community that's called a neighbor list that you would create. And then you use that neighbor list every time step to compute force interactions. But in a in a performance sense, you have this collection of particles that's moving around and reorganizing themselves, and then you're sort of computing random interactions between pairs or triplets of particles, depending on the model. And so that means you're kind of hitting random places in memory, trying to pick up particle attributes and do that in a cache-efficient manner. And so there's various schemes people use to try to make that efficient and lamps. I wouldn't say is necessarily very sophisticated in that uh, context, but we try to do things like create these neighbor lists efficiently and use them efficiently so that you get good single core performance. But, but now, the memory band, I, I'll add one thing, the memory bandwidth issue that you mentioned uh, 
is important because you're making these kind of random hits into memory or even if you organize your lists of particles and neighbor lists and things so that you have better cache performance, you still often are sort of memory bandwidth limited in how much data you can pull in to do these computations, especially for force fields that are fairly cheap so that you, you pay a cost for how, you know, how fast you can get particle coordinates and forces in and out of memory. Now, are there any other software tools or frameworks out there that, that help manage this kind of memory locality and, and uh, overlapping cache misses and things like that? Or do you rely you know, mostly on compiler optimizations and your, your own code strategies for this kind of stuff? In LAMPS, it's more the latter. I mean, we just basically try to, to write clean, simple C code that the compilers can do a good job with and maybe have some higher level algorithms that sort the particles and do things in a way that will help with the cache performance a bit. There is, I'm, I'm familiar with a method that the, I guess it's more for, I guess it wouldn't be so much single node performance, but the NAMD code has some higher level things it does with a sort of runtime system called CHARM that tries to reorganize the computation across different processors in order to get better parallel scalability. So that's kind of a higher level thing they do for performance optimization. So uh, LAMPS, though, is actually able to run on uh, multiple processors using MPI. And IBM was out to my day job one time trying to sell us a blue gene. And they actually held up LAMPS as an example of getting super scaling because they were running one atom per core, which was fully crazy. You never heard of anything like that. What is kind of the method LAMPS used to be able to get good MPI performance? Um, so I haven't, I hadn't heard about this one atom per processor number. I would, offhand, I would think that probably wasn't a, a limit in which LAMPS did very well. So I'd, I'd probably want to know more about that. But for a, for a parallel machine running MPI, what we do is take the simulation domain and chop it up into little blocks, one per processor. So it's what's termed a spatial decomposition of the simulation domain. And then to get good MPI performance, we just try to to do things in a semi-synchronous fashion where you have big messages uh, bundled up going back, you know, a few big messages between processors a few times a time step in order to sort of get optimal bandwidth and low latency uh, performance under MPI. So do you do parallelization with both MPI and threads or, or solely with MPI? Uh, Certainly initially in LAMPS it's been all MPI. We sort of targeted distributed memory platforms from the very beginning. There's been some work by a few people more recently to, you know, especially for like multi-core boxes and machines where you may not want to run MPI down to the individual core or process level to add some options for a more hybrid model. So we would still always do MPI at the high level, say between nodes, but allow some kind of threading or open MP kind of constructs uh, in some of the computational kernels at a low level. And I would say to this point, the, the results of that have been kind of mixed. It's still hard to beat, at least on machines with a modest number of cores per node, it's still hard to beat all MPI performance with threading. But as you know, you get higher and higher core counts on nodes, that might change in the next few years. So what were, you know, in, in, in taking your serial code and paralyzing it, what would you say some of the biggest challenges were? What were the difficulties that you ran into both uh, algorithmically and, you know, programmatically and, and trying to use parallel technologies? Uh, you're, you're asking back sort of in the early days when we first designed LAMPS as a parallel code, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so... I guess one thing we never did with LAMPS is we never really started with a serial code and tried to make it parallel. And I, I think this is true of probably most groups who write parallel codes for MD or other, other kinds of applications. I think you're usually better off sort of designing for parallel from the start rather than trying to adapt a serial code uh, that, that has a, a different set of problems. So, but I, but I think oftentimes, uh, for example, with this spatial decomposition method I mentioned, you can think if you can, you can sort of write it. I mean, lamps will run in parallel on some number of processors that you allocate, but it will also run on one processor. And so, in that case, the spatial decomposition that the one processor owns is just the entire simulation box. And so, you can sort of write the code uh, 
for cereal in a way that it's, you know, a processor knows about its domain and maybe it knows about the borders by creating some copies of atoms, something that's called ghost atoms. But doing that on one processor is sort of the same idea that you would do on multiple processors. So, so a processor would still own a little domain and know some boundary information that it shares either with itself or other processors. And so in that sense, the one processor mode for the code is really essentially the same as the mini processor mode. Okay, so it's it's good to hear you say that because we actually tell people the same thing. It's better to design for parallel rather than than try to adapt, to, depending on the scope of your application, of course. But what we're the, the the real thing I'm going after here is you know what what makes it hard to be parallel. Um, you know, is it, is it the algorithms itself, or uh, do you have challenges with individual MPI implementations or underlying? technologies or do you find that you never have a ne network bandwidth or you know what, what kind of things do you run into I see so for depending on depending on the physical model and whether for example you have long-range charge interactions and that alters some of the computational methods that you need to use but for something that really just involves short-range interactions which for a lot of materials problems is a good model uh, typically we we can scale up as large as you want, and we do, and the number of atoms per processor is sort of a, a rule of thumb that you try to follow to have enough atoms so that you're not spending all your time communicating information with other processors and paying a high cost for that. But as long as you have a few hundred or a few thousand atoms per processor, we can typically scale up quite nicely on most parallel machines that have a good MPI implementation, and so there. The rule of thumb might be that we hope to spend ten, no more than 10 to 20 percent of the time communicating and the other 80 percent computing. Now, if you have a model that a lot of the biological problems need, which is where you have these long-range charges, then you have a, essentially a long-range Coulombic problem to solve, and that's most often done in big MD codes with an FFT-based solution. And so now you have a big three-dimensional FFT to do across all your processors, and that can often limit scalability because that's something that takes a certain level of all-to-all -all communication in order to perform those FFTs. So that's a, a scalability bottleneck that a lot of codes face. I have a lot of users who do the more material science kind of work and not the biological work, and that's what they're using lamps for. The uh, question they're always asking is, uh, should we invest in InfiniBand or Ethernet? And, What's kind of your rule of thumb for deciding between the two? Um, well, nothing nothing beats an actual benchmark and an actual run in the problem, you know, especially for the kind of problem that you want to run. Um, but generally, like I said, if you were doing one of these short-range material science problems where the interactions, I mean, are short-range, you'd shoot for spending no more than 10 to 20 percent of your time doing communication. So. Uh, the, the numbers I've seen, and I don't, I don't necessarily have hard numbers off the top of my head, is that as you go to bigger systems, it's you know hundreds or several hundred processors. Typically, you, you do start to pay an overhead if you have poor hardware communication. And so, even something that should scale nicely up to you know hundreds or even thousands of processors will start to get uh, you'll you'll start to p take some hits if you don't have a good uh, uh, communication fabric on the machine. So there's a case where paying the extra money for something a little more expensive might be might pay off. You actually expect a significant, you know, speed up for a large number of processors even with uh Ethernet up to a decent amount? Um yeah, again I don't I don't necessarily have hard numbers and so I wouldn't I wouldn't want to mislead somebody. I guess, I guess the safest thing to do would be try it. It's also a function of what model you're running. I mean there's models that are inherently more computationally intensive just due to the force field interactions uh, versus cheaper. And so the, the communication part is kind of independent of that. So if you have something that's heavier computationally with a smaller amount of uh, communication relatively, then you might be able to get away with Ethernet to a larger number of processors. Okay. Now, a question that came in from the, the social networks uh, from uh, Carolyn came in something like this. A code like LAMPS you, you chose a certain decomposition scheme for parallelization roughly a decade ago. Can Steve discuss other types of ND parallelization schemes and where they apply 
and whether it is possible for distributed computing hardware to change significantly enough to make an alternate scheme be even better? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, bef before we had started on LAMPS, uh, myself and, and some others here at Sandia, we actually worked on alternate schemes trying to figure out good ways to parallelize particle simulations like molecular dynamics. And we had some that were more particle-based or were based more on splitting up the forces and ignoring some of the spatial information. And at the time, uh, as, as the question uh, alluded, at the time we sort of started with LAMPS, we decided, at least for big problems, lots of atoms uh, that, that the spatial decomposition approach would win, that it just scaled better in the, in the limit of large numbers of particles. What's changed in the last few years has been that sometimes people don't want to run just you know an infinitely huge number of particles, billions or trillions, but they want to run a relatively fixed size, a fixed size problem that's relatively small, maybe a hundred thousand, a few hundred thousand atoms, but they want to do it on more and more processors. So, you know, back 15 years ago, nobody really thought about machines with a hundred thousand cores or a million cores or something like that. That they're now starting to be deployed and are being proposed for future future petascale and exascale machines. And so if you want to do, say, a bio biological problem of a protein in water, and the, you know, the protein's not infinite in size, it has maybe these hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand atoms, and you really want to run it on a million cores, then you're kind of in this mode that uh, Brock mentioned, I think, a few minutes ago, of one atom per core or a few atoms per core. And that's a, that's a very different way to to have to have a code that works well in that limit is is kind of a different problem, and I don't think lamps and the methods in lamps necessarily are the best for that. And so there have been there has been work by other groups to t try to develop new methods for that. And probably the best known is a is a private company, D. E. Shaw, that's investing a lot of money, uh, private money, in going after that very problem, and has come up with some clever decomposition schemes. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting now the but the acronym or the name they use for those in their recent papers, but they have uh, methods that are kind of hybrids of, of splitting up forces and spatial uh, information in ways that get you better performance at these small numbers of atoms per processor. So surprisingly, for at least from the perspective of 10 or 15 years ago, this whole area of optimal ways to split up work for an MD code is, is actually an active area of research where there's been some quite clever ideas come out in the last few years. So speaking of uh, speeding things up, you guys recently released a uh, was it a beta or not? The uh, the accelerator support in lamps for certain methods, uh, GPUs and FPGAs and stuff accelerators they tend to favor a very different type of approach. How's that working in with the regular lamps model? Um, yeah, so it, I think all the accelerator stuff we've actually released in the code has been GPU specific and, and uh, for NVIDIA chips using a CUDA library that one of our uh, developers wrote uh, and has added some capabilities on top of. So the support for that in LAMPS is still fairly limited. Um, what's, what's been done so far is to take a few of the the, uh, these potentials, these pairwise potentials that are one of the big computational kernels in a typical MD run and sort of make a GPU version based on this CUDA library. And so I think the performance numbers for that have been, you know, kind of modest speed ups. If it's a cheap potential like Leonard Jones interactions, maybe a factor of four or five speed up uh, due to the GPU over a single core performance. Uh, for, one, for a more expensive potential that's like a aspherical potential between ellipsoid uh, particles called K gay burn that's quite expensive. It involves orientational dependence and other things. I think the speed ups were better, like up to about a factor of 100 on the GPU. But um, one of the challenges for LAMPS is that we have this huge menu of, of potentials uh, and interactions, and so sort of making a GPUized version of each one of those is a is a tedious, time-consuming process. So I think we're making you know we're making incremental steps in that direction, but uh, and, and also trying to look at some higher-level reorganization issues that would help on GPUs like building the neighbor lists and things like that. Uh, so we're we're moving in that direction, but I'd say it's a challenge for us because we have a lot of legacy code that that wasn't written with GPUs in mind. So now you specifically mentioned uh, CUDA in there, and I'm going to 
kind of repeat one of my previous questions to you that I asked about MPI. How well did you, you know, did the, well, you've already mentioned that some of the, your legacy code didn't map well to the abstractions uh, of, of GPUs and whatnot. But what, what other kinds of uh, challenges do you run into and how were there other parts of your code that did map well to accelerator-based models and their way of thinking and, you know, what other technical challenges did you run into? Yeah, so I, well, the real issue with GPUs in general um, is that if you're if you're doing an MD, if you're running an MD simulation and you have your calculation with all the data stored on the CPU, is that you're doing time stepping fairly rapidly depending on the size of the problem, but it might be many time steps per second, for example, and and every time step you need to do these force calculations, say, which is is something that is known to optimize well for the GPUs, but you have to ship the data back and forth in between the CPU and the GPU every time step. And so that's, you know, sending the particle coordinates and maybe some of this neighbor list information down to the GPU and, and getting the forces back. So a code like HoomD sidesteps that problem because it was designed from the ground up to sort of be an all GPU code, and so it keeps that data resident on the GPU and tries to do, you know, basically all the operations on the GPU and just occasionally get stuff back to the CPU. So that's why it's able to get some really impressive performance numbers in that kind of model. So for us in LAMPS, uh, you know, everything starts on the CPU, so we've been trying gradually to sort of coarse grain things and leave stuff on the GPU longer, build the neighbor lists on the GPU, let, you know, for the number of time steps that the neighbor lists are valid, let that data, if it can, just sit resonant on the on the GPU. But we can do that for some simple models, and, and people are experimenting with that, that, with that, and it does improve in performance. But there's a lot of other options in LAMPS, say other diagnostics or things you might want to compute, and so some of those need to happen back on the CPU or they'd have to be ported to the GPU. So it's, again, just kind of an incremental thing with how much of that calculation can we push onto the GPU and make GPUized versions of those various uh, calculations. So the accelerator functionality was something new. What other new stuff do you want to see added to LAMPS? Um, so we have kind of a laundry list or a wish list of things we're either working on ourselves or, or, or know of other groups that are working on it and are kind of collaborating with them. Most of those uh, things are sort of science-based or feature-based, new, you know, new capabilities or new options in the code to do new kinds of problems. Is, is that the kind of question you're asking, or are you were more, more sticking to this performance or optimization mode and talking about new, you know, new features for accelerators or things like that that would be uh, interesting to work on? Uh, either or, whatever is most interesting to you. Okay. Well, let me, let me mention the science features first then. Um, th there's a lot of interest in, and, and uh, maybe I should state uh, something that's a common, a common complaint or a common uh, bottleneck, I guess, for molecular dynamics codes, and that is that you're always limited in, in sort of length scale, the number of particles you can simulate, as well as time scale. And time scale is probably the more interesting or more crucial bottleneck. You always seem to want to run your systems longer than you can afford computational time to, to do the models. And so the whole area of sort of coarse graining your interactions, getting away from the atomic scale if you can as you do larger molecules or mixtures of molecules and solvent uh, methods and techniques to allow you to coarse grain and do your computations faster so you can get out to longer time scales is a, is a common theme and a big area of research. And so we've got some efforts uh, trying to let you do, for example, nanoparticles in solution, and this is a collaborative effort with some companies uh, that contribute to this as well. And so we've been developing methods that let you coarse grain your solvent in very inter various interesting ways to focus on the, na the big nanoparticles and, and coarse grain the, the nanoparticle, nanoparticle interactions. And so we've got some techniques we're developing and hope to release soon in the code for that, uh, allowing you to do inter more interesting kinds of big nanoparticles that are not just big spheres, but uh, ellipsoids or irregular aspherical particles that might be gridded up in some way to make an interesting shape and how those shapes interact with each other. That's an active area of research for us. Um, other methods more tuned for solid state systems where you can accelerate time 
by some of the methods, for example, that Art Voter at Los Alamos has worked on for the last few years. These are things like parallel replica dynamics, temperature, accelerated dynamics, which requires the ability to find events and barriers uh, in, a, in a sophisticated parallel way. Those are techniques and methods that we're trying to add to the code and try out on different problems. Um, let's see, I guess, I guess with some other, those are things we're involved with directly here at Sandia. There's some other groups that are doing some interesting things that I think will be added soon to the code. There's an electron-based force field to allow you to do something at a sort of a lower level, more akin to a quantum dynamical simulation that some folks at Caltech have been adding to, to LAMPs that we hope to release soon. Um, there's other people that are coupling LAMPs to other codes, either at the mesoscale or the continuum level, to do sort of coupled particle finite element or uh, particle mesoscale uh, Monte Carlo kinds of simulations. And so that's one option that LAMPs provides is kind of to use LAMPs as a library that makes it easy to, to work in tandem with other codes and is letting some people do some multi-scale kinds of problems. And so we try to release the hooks and the, the options that get added to the code to support those kind of calculations in the main version as well. Uh, so those, those, I guess, would be a summary of the science directions we're trying to go. Something you said there, and I remember seeing on the website, but I didn't think of that ahead of time. The uh, using lamps as a library, you can actually use lamps as a library and instead of using it as a, its own application. That's right. Yeah. In fact, if you look if you look in the code, the main .cpp, if you build it as a standalone code, is just about you know ten lines of code that instantiate lamps as a library and and hand it an input script. And so, uh, if you just take that away, you build lamps as a library, and then you could have your own driver program that instantiated one or more versions of LAMPs, like say you wanted to run you know, MD in different regions of a big continuum model and have some overlaying mesh that you built yourself in your own application that uh, let the, the mesh be fine-grained in different parts with particles. So you could certainly write an application that called LAMPs as a library on top of it to, to do that. That's a, that's a really cool feature to be able to kind of, like you said, hook LAMPs, some stuff from LAMPs into your own I mean, the options are endless here. Yeah, the the other thing that people have done, maybe even more than that, is 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 because LAMPS has this uh, ex extensibility option. You can write uh, something within LAMPS that will get invoked each time step or whenever you want that calls some external library. And so people have sort of used LAMPS as the driving program to call other libraries, sort of the inverse of what we just talked about, as well. And so. Yeah, we we try to make it flexible so you can use it in either of those modes. Now, a, a, a derivative but related question here is what what license is LAMPS under? GPL. It's just uh, totally open source code with the with the caveat that if people use it and modify it and want to distribute it themselves, they need to keep it GPL. Okay, so with GPL, do you see, uh, do you see, are there people out there who see that as a barrier to adoption? Uh, this is something, you know, coming from the industry side uh, of things. There, there are a lot of uh, trepidation, um, some fears founded, some fears unfounded about using GPL with code. Uh, you know, how are how are people's reactions to GPL? Yeah, we haven't. I guess I'm aware of some of those issues. We haven't had any direct feedback on LAMPs where some company has said, you know, we'd like to use it, but GPL is a barrier to us. I guess from a philosophical point of view, the reason we went with GPL in the first place, and I'm, I'm not really an expert on all the variants of open source licenses, but w the one thing we wanted to prevent really was a company, for example, commercializing LAMPs or taking LAMPs and putting some wrapper around it and selling it as their, you know, their code that they would make money off of. And, and as I say, we were just kind of philosophically opposed to that. So if, if that's what GPL prevents, then I guess we're, we're happy. We'd like it to just remain an open code that anybody can use for any purpose, but not, you know, not somebody else try to make money off it because we'd prefer it just to be open and people to be able to use it freely. So, yeah, we kind of interrupted you there. Uh, you got through the science additions you wanted to add to the code, but what about some of the system uh, functionality you'd like to add to the code? Sure. So, you know, all of the optimization things we talked about, uh, for example, for the GPUs is an ongoing area of interest. I, and, you know, I don't, 
we, we have effort going on in those areas. I don't know if we have any brilliant ideas as to things that are going to going to make big differences. One uh, outstanding research challenge, I think, and I, and I think sort of all the big, especially bio-related MD codes face this, is how to make this long-range coulombic part with the, F, the FFT-based uh, solvers uh, work well, both on a GPU, which means you know FFTs on the GPU, but also in a multi-GPU sense across GPUs. Um, so I know that's an active area that, that different groups are, are trying out methods and trying to figure out ways to do that better. And, and that may lead to non-FFT based uh, solutions, more real space, uh, uh, maybe multi-grid or other kinds of methods that might work better in parallel uh, w with the presence of the GPU. But a related hardware issue is it seems like most of the designs for the really high end, these petascale, exascale machines are, are going to achieve those big peak performance numbers through hybrid kinds of, of nodes. And so you'll have nodes that uh, have multiple cores and the GPU accelerator, obviously, with its own internal high number of cores. And so uh, creating an MD code with its kernels that are sort of designed to work well on those hybrid platforms where, say, you're doing your force calculation or your neighbor list in some way that splits the work evenly across many cores, say 16 or 32 cores, plus a GPU, and sort of is able to work and exploit all of that available uh, compute power in a nice way that's you know cleanly uh, available to the person writing the program. I don't know that those models exist yet, uh, but designing your code to take advantage of that is, is kind of a new challenge that's out on the horizon. So uh, this is some question that I ask to all open source developers. What uh, what Code, source code repository do you use and why? And how do you see that affect your community or, or not? So we use SVN, and it's an internal repository at Sandia. Uh, and, the, and, and we love SVN. It's, it's fine for our, our perfect, I guess, for our model of, of developing and upgrading the code. The one, the one hitch it puts uh, in place for us is really a Sandia institutional thing, and that is because it's an internal repository, we don't have the ability to give you know, random external people access to that repository, even in a read-only sense. And so we're actually working with Axel at uh, Temple University, who we mentioned a few minutes ago, to put a, a mirror of our SVN repository up. Hopefully it'll be up in the next month or so, so that people who want to sort of keep up to date with LAMPs uh, and the you know, latest bug fixes, new features that are released, because uh, we kind of we kind of just continually release those incrementally. We don't do really major releases every six months. We're more in a continuous mode, but that would allow other people to keep up to date with their versions just by doing SVN checkouts on that external mirror. So uh, let's get some contact information. There's a LAMPS mailing list and a LAMPS website. Uh, what's the website address? Uh, LAMPS, with two M's, lamps.sandia.gov. Okay, and you can get the code there and find the mailing list and register. The mailing list is pretty active. It's a great source of information, I found. Uh, I, just, I just thought of one thing that's a little anecdote about the name LAMPS. That it, it, it is an acronym and stands for something that's explained on the website. And when we came up with the name 10 or 15 years ago, we didn't envision this, but it was a great choice because it's a common word, lamp or lamps, but it's misspelled with two M's, and so that makes it very easy for people to find on the web. If we'd ended up with the acronym LAMP, I think no one would ever probably be able to find the website by doing a Google search because they'd see household appliances. <laughs> Excellent. So we, we typically ask this uh, of, of all of our guests here too, but what, what's the you know weirdest, most unanticipated use of your software that you've seen, where someone is just kind of using your software and you say, wow, I, I never would have thought of that. Hmm. That's a good question. I, I, th I think I, I'm, I will, I'll sidestep that for a second unless I can think of something really unusual. But one thing that often happens, on, I mean, when we started up the mail list two or three years ago is we, were, we realized we needed a more open forum for answering questions. There is a, a large number of people who post to the mail list who ask very beginner questions. And so, you know, we, we try to be polite. There's some of the people who answer on the list aren't as polite as others, but uh, we certainly get a lot of people just 
you know, that are asking basic Unix questions or Linux questions. You know, I, I can't run a program, or I I tried to I tried to point and click at the LAMPS directory on my Windows box and nothing happened. Why is that? Or you know, something like that. So we we get a lot of sort of crazy newbie questions, but. Uh, I can't. I can't. I'm trying to think of anybody who's used it for problems that are just totally out of the box. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not coming up with anything off the top of my head. It's certainly been used and adapted in a lot of ways for molecular dynamics models that we didn't anticipate when we first started. But those are, those are more kind of science questions than bizarre issues. Okay, Steve. Well, thank you very much for your time, and this show will be out soon. And you can find us at rce-camps.com. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for uh, thanks for your interest.